Your true wealth is your time and freedom. Money is just a tool for trading your time. It's a container to store your economic energy until you're ready to deploy it. But the whole world has been turned away from real money and has been fooled into using currency. A deceitful imposter that is silently stealing your two most valuable assets, your time and your freedom. Welcome to the rabbit hole. We are entering a period of financial crisis that is the greatest the world has ever known. The wealth transfer that will take place during this decade is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Wealth is never destroyed, it is merely transferred, and that means that on the opposite side of every crisis there is an opportunity. The great news is that all you have to do to turn this crisis into your great opportunity is to educate yourself. I believe that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is your own education. Education on the history of money, education on finance, education on how the global economy works, education on how all of these guys, the central bankers, the stock market, how they can cheat you, how they can scam you. If you learn what is going on and how the financial world works, you can put yourself on the correct side of this wealth transfer. Winston Churchill once said that the further you look into the past, the further that you can see into the future. This program is all about creating your own crystal ball, being able to gaze into the future, being able to change this crisis, the greatest crisis in the history of mankind, into your great opportunity. hidden secrets of money, some of them are hidden in plain sight. They're like right in front of you. Uh, the way the monetary system works is something that isn't actually hidden away from all of us. It's out in the open, but it's complex and people just don't, they can't see how it works. It's hard for them to imagine that we're living in such a hoax. Others are meant to be secret, but the truth is slowly coming out, like the Federal Reserve being a private corporation and not really part of the US government. But when I started studying this, uh, what I found was that there was no place that I could point people to where they could get it all in one spot. And so I basically decided to write my book about it and consolidate monetary history, economics, the markets, uh, fundamentals of gold and silver. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in economics and I've sort of made it my job to lift the fog for people. Welcome to Egypt. This is where it all began. Roughly 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians started using gold and silver as their predominant form of currency. But it was not yet money. The pieces of gold and silver that they were using were odd sizes and weights, odd purities, so it still was not interchangeable, where each unit is the same as the next. This meant that nothing really had a price yet. You couldn't put a price of so many coins on something because they didn't have coins yet. Trade was still difficult. It was still a guessing game when it came to the exchange of values. One of the reasons that we are in the financial mess that we are today globally is that people do not understand the difference between currency and money. Currency is a medium of exchange a unit of account. It is portable, durable, divisible, and something called fungible. Fungible means that each unit is the same as the next unit. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. Money is all of those things plus a store of value over a long period of time. Even financial planners, bankers, your accountant, they don't understand the difference between currency and money. The currency in your pocket is a medium of exchange. It's a unit of account because it's got numbers on it. It's somewhat durable, it's portable, it's divisible in that you can make change, and it's fungible. A dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. But because governments can print more and more and more of it, 
and dilute the currency supply. It's continually transferring wealth out of your pocket, out of your bank account, to the government and to the banking system. The reason that gold and silver are the optimum form of money is because of their properties. It's an easy medium of exchange because gold and silver store a large amount of value in a very small area. It's a unit of account. Pure gold has the same value all over the planet. So an ounce of gold buys the same amount here in Egypt as it would in China or in the United States. It's durable. The same gold that Egyptians were using in trade 5,000 years ago is still here with us today. It does not corrode. It's divisible. You can make change with it. It's very portable. You could use something like oil as money. It's just that you can't carry around a barrel of oil on your back. It's fungible. Pure gold is the same wherever it is on Earth. Pure silver is the same wherever it is on Earth. It's limited in quantity. That's the reason that it maintains its purchasing power. Governments cannot print it. Over the last 5,000 years, only gold and silver have maintained their purchasing power. There have been thousands upon thousands of fiat currencies, currencies that are unbacked by gold or silver, and they have all gone to zero. It's a 100% failure rate. Well, fiat currency, of course, is um, a currency that is, exists at the dictate or by fiat from a, from a government. You say they have their printing presses, and the paper money rolls off the printing presses. And then they give it the fiat designation, which in makes the currency official. It's just worthless paper. But when Ben Bernanke gives it the special sign, and they have the cult meeting at the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, it suddenly becomes currency. If you look at what's really going on, it's, it's a con game. And so there's confidence. Well, the Federal Reserve is very forthright about what they're doing. If you read their websites, they'll tell you it's a confidence game. They tell you that there's no intrinsic value in their money. They'll tell you that they print it back by absolutely nothing. They actually display all these facts. But if you tell somebody in the public that this stuff is created out of thin air, there's no backing whatsoever, it's absolutely worthless, it's about as valuable as monopoly money, they'll look at you like you're nuts. Is there an example throughout history of a fiat currency, a piece of paper that's unbacked by anything, surviving? Short answer, no. Long answer, no. And here's why. When Addison Wiggin took over at the Daily Record when I got cranked up, uh, Bill Warner asked him to catalog all of the fiat currencies throughout history and what happened to each of them. Addison dutifully went to work. Within a short period of time, he had gone through the alphabet all the fiat currencies that started with the letter A were done. They all went to zero. He was halfway through the letter B and all the fiat currencies that started with the letter B and there were 600 of them in just the first letter and a half of the alphabet and every single one of them went to zero. Every one. 600 fiat currencies that start with the letter A and half of the ones that start with the letter B are 600 of these things. Not one ever came close. Do you think this one, the United States dollar, is going to be the first one after all that? <laughs> I don't think so. No. No currency, fiat currency has ever survived. None. The thing about money is there actually is a fairly well accepted definition of what money is. The question is, as you apply that definition to particular things that, are, that people claim to be money, do they fit the definition? Well, just take the paper dollar, for example. How well does it perform those functions? Well, store of value. Uh, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So, not very good as a store of value. One of the things I do is uh, just a way to get the audience's attention is I have a slide and there are three pictures on the slide. One is a pile of monopoly money. The other one is a pile of Federal Reserve notes, uh, what Americans would call paper money. Uh, and the other one is a solid gold uh, American Eagle uh, one ounce coin. And the title of the slide is which of these is not like the other and if you know the show Sesame Street or you have children who watch it, it's one of the favorite vignettes in Sesame Street and what it really is is a kind of IQ test for five year olds. They're supposed to look at the three things and look at characteristics and find the one that's not like the other. Well, I've shown this slide to um, groups of 
you know, Ivy League University professors, and I've also shown it to, uh, you know, uh, children, you know, kind of five years old, my nieces and nephews and so forth. Uh, and when the uh, professors look at it, they say, well, um, clearly the, uh, the dollars are not like the others because gold has no role as money, and monopoly money is junk, and the American dollar is a store of value, so that's not like the other. But the children look at it and they say, well, the gold coin is not like the other because the other two are just piles of paper and the gold coin is clearly something different. So my question to the audience is, who's smarter, a five-year-old or an Ivy League professor? Before World War I, each note that a treasury issued would say that there have been deposited with the United States Treasury $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer upon demand. The money was in the vault the currency was a note they gave you that was a claim check, only a claim check on the money, the same as if you go to the dry cleaners and you give them your shirt and they give you a claim check for your shirt. The value is, is that shirt at the dry cleaners, not the piece of paper that says that you own that shirt. So our currency that circulated was the paper U.S. dollars and they were claim checks on money. The next hidden secret is the difference between currency and money. Money must be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. As we progress through this series, you'll learn that national currencies are really a tool used by the government and the financial sector to leech away your time and your freedom by stealing your purchasing power. So rather than storing your economic energy, currencies leak. Now compare that to the gold and silver the Egyptians were using. Like I started with, it still wasn't money because it wasn't interchangeable yet. But they were on the right track, as gold and silver have proven over thousands of years to be the ultimate store of value. Gold is only formed when a star explodes, a supernova, and it stays around forever. This is one of the properties that make it the ultimate money. You know, people are amazed that after 5,000 years, the pyramids are still here. But what I'm more amazed at is that the currency that the people that built this were using, that currency, that gold and silver that they were using in trade on a daily basis, is still around today. It may have been melted down and re-refined and it's in a coin or a bar or in some piece of jewelry but it's still with us today, and it still purchases something. Yes, it is the ultimate money because there is nothing else even in the same league. It's divisible, it's permanent, it's a store of value, it's oh, in a unit of account, it's got everything you want out of money, but it doesn't go away, and it can't be increased. That is what makes gold the most beautiful money of all. What more can you ask out of a money? It keeps governments under control. You can maintain a solvent system. Governments don't like gold at present because they're getting away with the fiat currencies and they'll do everything they can to discredit it as an asset class. I mean, my goodness, gold has uh, outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average in each of the last seven years. Uh, yet it's not considered a legitimate asset class. Why? Again, it's the fear that maybe gold will be imposed on the system, that it will constrain government ability to spend beyond its means. They can't print it. They can't print it, no. The proper definition of inflation, I use Milton Friedman's definition. Inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Deflation is a contraction of the currency supply. If you expand the currency supply, eventually prices will rise. And if you contract the currency supply, eventually prices will fall. This is a pool, but it's not a pool of water. This is a, the currency pool. And these are prices. And if you expand the currency supply, prices like a sponge in water have to rise to suck up the excess currency. Governments never stop printing more currency and adding currency to circulation. Therefore, Prices keep on going up, not because the stuff that you're trying to buy is changing. The real estate doesn't change. What has changed is the currency purchases less and less. It's the currency going down, not prices going up. 
The truth is, what we have that makes our world work right now is a big story. None of it's real. It's all just promises. And if you think about it, that's how currency began to work in the beginning. You know, before we had currency, we had barter. I'll give you three coconuts and you give me four fish, because that's kind of a fair exchange on coconuts to fish. But that got complicated, so we had to invent this thing called money to be a divisible, portable medium of exchange. And the challenge is, is that we lost that a long time ago when we lost having things of value be our currency. And now we have this thing called numbers and accounts. But trust me, it is not real. It's a big made up story. One of the biggest make believe stories ever is called quantitative easing, which sounds complex, but it's really just a smoke and mirrors term for currency creation. QE started with the banking bailouts back in 2009. This currency was created out of thin air and then given to the banks who paid themselves record bonuses in reward for crashing the world economy. This is a global phenomenon, but all you have to remember for now is that whether it's QE bailouts or stimulus programs, these are all just voodoo, hocus pocus terms for increased currency creation. I believe gold and silver will reassert themselves as money. And when they do, there just isn't enough. And their purchasing power is going to go up many, many, many times. Egypt is an amazing place. There's a franticness about it, an utter chaos, especially like the traffic. But when it comes to like all of the merchants that are trying to get every last dime out of you, you get fleeced to the point where you come back with an empty wallet. <laughs> but you know what? They're amateurs compared to Wall Street. In the past several years, I've, I've spoken in many countries about the crisis that's coming. And a lot of people think that they're going to be OK in their country, that it's only going to happen to the United States or maybe the United States in Europe. Uh, but what they don't realize is that this is a global phenomenon. I gotta show you something here. This is a base currency in the United States. This is the number of paper dollars that exist, basically. It took 200 years to go from no dollars in existence to 825 billion. And then we had the bailouts, and then we had QE1, quantitative easing, one, then QE2, and then we had QE3, and then QE4, and then soon we're going to have QE57 and QE382. <laughs> and uh, it isn't just here. This is what the Canadian currency supply looks like. This is Australia, South Africa, Russia. Now, this starts out in just the year 2001, and this is like 18 times more currency in existence in a little over a decade. Uh, here's Singapore, same story. Look at that, since the crisis, just bam. India, China, every government on the planet is doing this insane deficit spending and expanding their currency supplies, uh, doing bailouts. And history shows that th there is no example of this turning out well. It is sometimes amazing that we haven't experienced more inflation than we have. If they keep expanding the money supply so vastly, why aren't our prices growing faster than they really are? And the answer is that a good chunk of the money that the Fed created has been shipped overseas. Uh, I remember early in my research, I heard this expression that the Americans have exported their inflation. I thought, what is that? How can you export your inflation? Put it in a box and send it out? What do you do? Well, now I understand you export your inflation by simply sending all these dollars that you created to these other countries, and then they send you their refrigerators and their cars and whatever, their TV sets. So you get hardware, and they get little pieces of paper. It's a great deal for the American people for a while. For a while. Sooner or later, all of those pigeons come home to roost. When the time comes, as it looks like it's now coming, when the rest of the world is saying, uh-uh, we don't want to play this game anymore. Uncle Sam's dollars are just becoming worthless. There are too many of them. We've got to find something else other than American dollars. Then those dollars start to come back to America. People say, we don't want them anymore. What do we do with them? Once this revs up and we've got this 
uh, this little trickle of money coming back that we previously exported, when, once it becomes a flood and it starts to rush back, now we are getting our former exported inflation brought back to us. And then we'll see the quantity of money inside the United States grow much more rapidly, even than the Federal Reserve can create it, because we're getting a previous money back. And uh, that's when we will really see the tanking of the U.S. dollar in terms of what it will buy. During the second round of quantitative easing, global food prices went up 60 percent. And this created a humanitarian disaster for the two billion people on Earth who live on less than two dollars a day. These people were hungry to start with, they became hungrier, and some of them started overthrowing their governments in North Africa and around the Middle East. So quantitative easing was the spark that ignited the Arab Spring. So that's, that's it. When you create money, you get some sort of inflation. It just depends on where the inflation goes. It's all going down, 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 as in surreally, from a game of coins and crowns. Given the premise that you have a permanent underclass or poor class, and how does inflation affect them disproportionately, um, it affects them basically in the percentage of their income that goes to food. And we see this as a ratio, and we know that there are some danger points. For example, in Egypt recently, once that ratio got to 40% of income going to food and the price of food rising due to inflation, when it got to 40%, that's uh, historically a point where people actually stage a revolution. That's exactly what we saw. The French Revolution, similarly, was all around the price of food getting to a certain critical point where people simply, the risk reward for revolution was favorable toward revolution. When they print it up, then it all goes down. Well, exactly right, because when you have a runaway inflation, it's punishing the very people who are most productive in society. In other words, the people that produce more than they consume and save the difference. The problem is, is that those productive people, the savers, save in their national currency. And unfortunately, the national currency is just a fiat piece of paper at this point. So when it's destroyed through runaway inflation, that uh, $100,000 that you were hoping to retire on doesn't exist. And the things that you were going to buy with it and provide for others don't exist either. Now what are you going to do? So that all seems pretty scary. However, uh, th you know, this is going to happen, and you can only play the hand that you're dealt. But the great news is that gold and silver always end up doing an accounting of the expansion of the currency supplies. Basically, the will of the public and the free markets, when governments do this kind of stuff to their currency supply, they debase it. Eventually, it comes back in inflation. People sense the loss of their purchasing power. They rush back to gold and silver, and they bid the value of the gold and silver up in the country until it meets or exceeds the value of all the currency in circulation. This is a process that's been going on over and over again throughout history, except this time it's happening on a global scale. It has never before happened in all countries at once. And that means that this is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Therefore, it's the greatest opportunity in history, and it's not going to happen again in your lifetime. So now we've learned that your true wealth is your time and your freedom. Money is a trading tool that stores the economic energy that is your time and freedom, whereas currencies leak them away. Gold and silver are the ultimate money simply because of their properties. Fiat currencies are based solely on confidence and always return to their intrinsic value of zero. Governments don't like gold because it imposes restraint. Rising prices are a symptom of an expanding currency supply and gold and silver always account for an expanding currency supply. So that's it for this episode. Join me next time as we begin to investigate how monetary history just repeats and repeats and how gold and silver always win the battle between currency and money. Until then, my challenge to you is to stop calling currency money. It's a crucial first step towards setting your mind free of all this economic voodoo and changing your context. You can learn more by watching the bonus features on our website, and if you have any questions, you can post them there, and we'll answer some of your questions in future bonus features. So good luck, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.
does Fiat mean? It comes from the Latin for crappy car. <laughs> Desert in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> My camel died. You're not too <laughs> sure about that, are you? Huh? The world is going to have a new monetary system in this decade that we're in. We're going to experience this huge deflationary crash around the world, and people will just lose confidence in currency. And what do they always go back to? throughout history, time after time for the last 5,000 years actually, they always go back to gold and silver. So it all started back in 1999 when my sister and I hired a financial planner to help my mother with her assets and we gave him control of the family's assets and in the next year and a half he lost 50 percent of what she had. You know, he would come to us every six months, we'd have a meeting and he'd have this smile on his face, just ear to ear smile going, we did really well, the S&P lost uh, 24 percent and you only lost 18. <laughs> and so uh, I fired him <laughs> and I moved all of her assets to cash and I dove into studying the financial markets, which led me to, into studying the economy. And when you start reading about the global economy, the people that are concerned with trade deficits and uh, budget deficits, it's the hard money advocates, the gold community. And once I started reading them, they also write about monetary history, and then I really fell in love. Because monetary history just repeats and repeats over and over again echoing all the way back to the beginnings of civilization. Gold and silver have been the predominant currencies for about 5,000 years. But it wasn't until somewhere between 680 B.C. and 630 B.C. that they became money. That's when they were minted into coins of equal weights somewhere in Lydia, where each coin was the same size and had the same weight. This made them interchangeable. It's called fungible. At that point, they became useful as a unit of account, a measurement. You could price a good or a service in those gold or silver coins in a certain number of them. And it was always the same for anybody whenever they were buying that good or service. But it wasn't until they made their way to the world's first free market society, the prototype of democracy, the cradle of civilization, Athens, that they exploded in use. Suddenly, money found its natural home, the free markets. Athens was the first society to have a working tax system and free markets. This enabled them to rise to the pinnacle of civilization. Their prosperity allowed them to create great works of art and achieve a level of architecture and engineering that the world had not yet seen. Here we are 2,500 years later and people are still in awe of their achievements. It was truly a fantastic period in human history, and the Athens star shone brightly for many years. So this begs the question, what went wrong? How did such a great and powerful civilization fall? The answer lies in the same pattern that we see throughout history. Too much greed and too much war. It was when the Athenians got involved in the Peloponnesian Wars a war with Sparta, that their monetary problems began. First, they lost access to their gold and silver mines. They were also paying armies that were on foot and they were miles and miles away from Athens. So as they pay their armies to buy goods and services from the local populations, a deflation occurs in Athens because they're sending all of their coinage out of the city. Then they started debasing their coinage to pay for the war. If you take in a thousand coins in taxes, 
and then you melt those down, those gold coins, and you mix 50% copper into your gold, now you can mint 2,000 coins. So if you take in only 1,000 coins, but you spend 2,000 coins, what is that called? That is deficit spending. Athens began to do that during this war with Sparta. They also had these great public works, which were very expensive, and they finished the Temple of Athena Nike during the truce in the middle. There was a six-year truce in the middle of this 27-year war. So they didn't stop their great public works and allow their market economy to heal from the expense of this war. As they debased their coinage, people would take the new debased coins at face value at first until there were a whole bunch of those and there's something called Gresham's Law where people tend to uh, save to keep the thing that's rare and they spend the thing that's common into circulation first. So all of the gold and silver coins started to disappear from circulation and become quite rare and it was just these copper coins. Suddenly, it took a whole bunch of copper coins to buy a gold or silver coin, one of those old gold or silver coins. This is the first time that gold or silver ever had a price. Before that, everything was measured in a weight of gold and silver. So a large factor in Athens' downfall was the expense of war, the expansion of empire, the debasement of their currency, the eventual inflation that was caused. You know, they minted these coins until they became nothing but flecks of copper. This was actually the world's first hyperinflation. And what it did was it financially debilitated Athens to the point where in 404 BC they surrendered to Sparta. And eventually they became nothing but a satellite of Rome. The thing that amazes me is how history just keeps on repeating and repeating and repeating. And we never learn from all of our stupid mistakes. We just repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. Today we are doing the same thing that the Athenians did that caused the loss of their great culture. We're doing the same currency debasement. We're doing the same deficit spending. And it's for the same reasons. It's for war and it's for great public works. The interesting thing about the, the Peloponnesian War was how it started. Um, I would say one of the interesting parallels is that it's, it started really with Athens at its height and with a, a level of hubris that set them down the road towards ruin. Perhaps they felt that they were, uh, you know... Superior, superior. couldn't make a mistake, exactly. they knew better. Exactly, <laughs> and they ended up destroying their society as a result. It's a road that we're going down today, right? I think absolutely. Yeah. There was a play written uh, shortly after the Peloponnesian Wars about the worthlessness of the copper flecks that uh, are, were their coinage at the time. So we, we go from gold and silver, very high value money, to a currency that has a face value. And it's the first example that I can find in history uh, where a war was, uh, war and great public works were being funded through deficit spending. What you've just seen is the first recorded example of one of the most predictable hidden secrets of money, the seven stages of empire. It's a long-term cycle that echoes throughout history right to this very day and is basically a societal pendulum that swings from quality money to quantity currency and back again to quality money. It always plays out in seven stages. It always ends with gold delivering a knockout blow to debased currencies. And it goes like this. Stage one, a country starts out with good money, which is either gold or silver, or it's backed by gold or silver. Stage two, as it develops economically and socially, it begins to take on more and more economic burdens, adding layer upon layer of public works. Stage three, as its economic affluence grows, so does its political influence, and it increases expenditures to fund a massive military. Stage four, eventually it puts its military to use and expenditures explode. Stage five, to fund the war, it steals the wealth of its people by debasing their coinage with base metals or by replacing their money with currency that can be created in unlimited quantities. Stage six, the loss in purchasing power of the expanded currency supply is sensed by the population and the financial markets, triggering a loss of faith in the currency. Stage 7. 
a mass movement out of currency into precious metals and other tangible assets takes place. The currency collapses and gold and silver rise in price as they account for the huge quantity of currency that was created. This process transfers massive wealth to those who had the foresight to position themselves beforehand in real money, gold and silver. You know, our monetary system uh, basically steals from the poor and middle class and transfers the wealth to the banks. We see this throughout history and it's just repeating over and over again. What's happening in Greece right now is basically the same thing that was happening back in 407 BC. The deficit spending to fund all of these public works and the debasement of their currency supply caused them to become nothing but a satellite of Rome. Today, they're becoming nothing but a satellite of the banks. Well, the idea of Gresham's Law is simply that people are going to hold on to what's value and spend what isn't value. Way, way back in my youth, I was 11 years old when we went from a silver-based monetary system to a purely fiat system. People saw that uh, silver was money, they got used to it, they didn't really think about it. And in 1965, under President Johnson, he basically said, well, silver's too valuable to be money. We're going to just uh, start putting out these substitutes, which were what we call cupro-nickel coins. They were nickel, uh, they were copper-plated with nickel at the time. And, of course, the metal value was far less. And I understood that as a kid, and yet very few adults really seemed to get the idea of what was really going on. There were a few, and it only takes a few. And, of course, the aggression of law took effect, so the currency came out of circulation rapidly. It's very interesting to me, you know, knowing monetary history fairly well, is they're always, you know, put out in uh, silver-looking or gold-looking form. I mean, in most cases, uh, you'll have, in fact, they look rather interesting. I mean, some of them are like silver on the inside and gold on the outside with the look. They have no value at all, really, other than melt value of pot metal. To me, it's sort of at a subconscious level. Why are they making them gold colored? Why are they making them silver colored? I think there's an inherent knowledge in the human species that knows that gold and silver have value. So if they look in their pocket and they see something gold colored or silver colored, it makes it, it gives them kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, but there's no value in these coins really. The next question is, how does this affect you? My next stop was in London where I'd been asked to give a presentation to a group of businessmen. They wanted to understand the reason that gold had surged recently and I explained to them that to understand gold you have to understand monetary history. Once you see where we've come from you can get a much clearer understanding of how the seven stages of empire are playing out right now. We weren't allowed to show their faces but we were allowed to film my presentation. So here it is, the last 140 years of monetary history condensed into just 10 minutes. Keep the seven stages of empire in mind, and as you watch this, see if you can recognize the signs. Everybody thinks the U.S. dollar is still as good as gold, and it hasn't been since 1971. This is the uh, world monetary systems. Uh, from 1873, when Germany went on the classical gold standard, where each unit of currency is backed up by an equivalent amount of gold in the treasury. In the United States, $20 bill, $20 gold piece in the vaults. Go into any bank, slap down your currency, which was a receipt for money, a claim check on money, ask for your money, gold and silver, and they would give it to you. So this shows, this is currency, this is money. Otherwise, there was no reason for any government to store gold in their vaults and then print this currency that was backed by gold this is what gives confidence in that, and it gives governments the ability to start this scam in the first place, where they print these receipts for gold, and then they can print more of them than, than gold that exists. And that happened when we got to World War I, and all the combatants stopped redemption rights. You could no longer go in the bank and, and trade your pounds, lira, marks, francs, no longer redeemable in gold and they lit up the printing presses and started printing like crazy. Then between the wars, they went on something called the gold exchange standard, where currencies would be backed partially by gold. So in the United States, under the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, 
we could, the Federal Reserve was allowed to put uh, $50 worth of claim checks on gold, currency in circulation, backed up by only $20 worth of gold. So it was a 40% reserve ratio. For every $20 gold piece in the vault, they could uh, put $50 in circulation. We're the dollars of the nation on parade. We're the biggest batch of dollars ever made. Oh, we used to march by millions, but now we march by billions. And maybe we'll be trillions for your day. We're the uh, then we get to 1944. Now, during both wars, Europe paid the U.S. with gold. Uh, during World War I, the U.S. didn't get into the war until the very end of it. We didn't really have troops on the ground here in any quantity until the last six months of the war. So for the first four years or so, we're selling you all of, you know, you take all of your young men off of the farms and turn them into soldiers. You take your factories that make toasters and they start making machine guns. Your factories that made cars are now building tanks. And uh, so you turn your economy toward war and all of your consumer goods and your grains had to be imported from the United States uh, and you paid us with gold. Uh, then in World War II, Hitler starts saber rattling in 1936, uh, annexes Austria in 38, invades Poland in 39. Uh, Pearl Harbor wasn't until the end of 1941. We didn't have troops on the ground until I believe August of 42. So again, there's like six years where you're paying us with your gold and we're selling you stuff. This is where Americans have this myth that war is good for the economy. War is good for the economy if you're not in it and you're selling them the tools of the trade. Yes, America's national income gets bigger and bigger. In 1943, it was $142 billion. That was double the 1939 figure, triple the figure for 1933. But by the end of World War II, the U.S. had two-thirds of all the world's monetary gold, the central bank gold, and the rest of the world had to share the other third, and Europe had none. So the world monetary system was no longer going to work. It would collapse. But we had made all these loans of dollars to Europe, so Europe was flooded with dollars. And so representatives from around the world met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944. They came up with a new world monetary system called the Bretton Woods system, where every currency on the planet, with the exception of just a few, they would be backed by the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar would then be backed by gold at $35 per ounce. This gave confidence to all currencies. Uh, so this gave the world stability, and it pegged all the world's currencies to each other through the dollar to yep. gold. So there was no such thing as the Forex. Currencies didn't float. Uh, the exchange rates were fixed year after year and this helped to make world trade boom. Then the dollar standard starts because we kept on printing dollars. Under the Bretton Woods system, there, there was no reserve ratio established where the U.S. actually had to have a certain amount of gold for how many dollars we created. So we had done a bunch of deficit spending for Korea, for Vietnam, for Johnson's Great Society, and expanded the currency supply, the amount of uh, paper dollars in circulation, and exported them all over the world. And then in the 60s, Charles de Gaulle, president of France, realizes that we don't have the gold to back up the dollars. Le fait que beaucoup d'États acceptent par principe des dollars au même titre que de l'or entraîne les Américains à s'endetter et à s'endetter gratuitement vis-à-vis -vis de l'étranger. Car ce qu'ils lui doivent, ils le lui payent avec des dollars qu'il ne tient qu'à eux d'émettre. Nous estimons nécessaire que les échanges internationaux soient établis comme c'était le cas avant les grands malheurs du monde sur une base monétaire indiscutable et qui ne porte la marque d'aucun pays en particulier. Quelle base En vérité, on ne voit pas qu'il puisse y avoir réellement de critères, des talons autres que l'or. And he uh, starts asking, France asks, asks for their gold and trades in, in the dollars. And at that point, other countries saw this and start jumping on board. And uh, the U.S. lost 50% of its gold 
from 1959 to 1971, but we still had in 71 about 12 times more dollars that we had created than there was gold. And this run on the bank, basically, the U.S. now being the bank, this is a giant worldwide bank run, because the U.S. for the second time had committed a fraud and created more receipts for gold than there was gold. It's, it's that simple. And then finally the markets sort of sensed this. And Nixon was forced to take us off the gold standard because if he had paid out gold until it got to zero, once we couldn't pay on some of those dollars, the entire worldwide monetary system would have collapsed. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. In full cooperation with the International Monetary Fund and those who trade with us, we will press for the necessary reforms to set up an urgently needed new international monetary system. And on August 15th, 1971, all the world's currencies became fiat currency. I don't know why the rest of the world didn't rush out and hang him, <laughs> but, but they didn't. They just all went along with this. To our friends abroad, I give this assurance. The United States has always been and will continue to be a forward-looking and trustworthy trading partner. There have been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fiat currencies throughout history, and there isn't one that survived. It is a 100% failure rate. And we started this experiment went where all the world's currencies would be fiat currencies simultaneously in 1971. But what we have here, 30 to 40 years, different monetary system, 30 years, 28 years, 39 years plus, what's next? The world is going to have a new monetary system in this decade that we're in. We're going to experience this huge deflationary crash around the world. The world will probably end up on some sort of new monetary system, probably after governments try and print their way out of this and cause hyperinflations of of all the currencies and people will just lose confidence in currency and what do they always go back to throughout history time after time for the last five thousand years actually they always go back to gold and silver in a world of floating currencies and that's what all national currencies are today they bob up and down relative to each other but they're all sinking relative to gold that includes the dollar as well as the euro and the british pound and all the others they're going to continue to lose value continue to lose purchasing power Personally, I don't think there's any way of avoiding what is coming. There's no way to fix it right now. There's only uh, a way to either let it wipe you out or to benefit from it. And I want to make sure that it's not just all of, it's not just a few of the big investors in the world that are ending up with all the cookies. I want to make sure that there's as many small investors as possible that are benefiting from it because that's what makes society run middle class, small investor. One of the biggest challenges for human beings is that physiologically we are designed to operate in recency. You know, the fight or flight response is, is literally in my cells, literally. And, and so that when I'm in the wild, it's about I need to look for something to eat or make sure I don't get eaten. And how that translates into the modern world is that we think only about what's happening immediately in front of us. And so we think a long time is last week. In the world of YouTube and Facebook and instant messaging, we think three seconds is a long time. Like, did you get the post already? I already posted it. And the reality is that if you look at history, and I don't mean a week, I don't mean a month, I mean decades, I mean a hundred years, I mean a couple of hundred years, I mean more than a couple of hundred years, you can start to see some patterns. You can see some things that are going on because history repeats itself. There's some trends and there are some movements that you can learn from. And you literally have to go outside of your, your human instincts to look at history because we just want to focus on right now because as I said, that's about either eating or being eaten. So we've got to go beyond that and that means not just focusing on the here and now but learning some real powerful stuff from what's happened because there just might be some indicators there as what's going to happen in the future. Now, the seven stages of empire, just as a reminder, started with sound money. And then a country uh, adds layers of public works and social programs. 
and then develops a massive military, and then puts that military to use. And to pay for the war, it debases its currency supply, which causes a loss of faith in the currency, which then leads to a currency crisis, and gold does an accounting of the expansion of that fiat currency supply that happened over all those years of the first five stages. We are in the sixth and beginning the seventh stage. Gold started the accounting in the year 2001. It was $250 then, but we're still in the very early stages of this. Well, well, that's right. I think one of the problems with gold is people just don't understand it. I mean, for one thing, it's sort of been banished from the curriculum for 35 years. We have going on two generations of academics and scholars who have never studied gold. Unless you're a specialist in economic history, you can go back and look at it. Now, when I was in university and uh, even when I was in graduate school in economics, uh, we were still on the gold standard in some form. It was fairly attenuated, but when you, when you studied the IMF and you looked at how they present the finances of a country and the breakdown of the reserves and um, you know, the capital accounts, gold was a line item in the capital account and you had to understand how it, uh, what role it played and how it, it you know, could equilibrate in terms of balance of trade. Well, that's gone. The IMF, uh, you know, Nixon went off the gold standard in 1971 and bright young economic students just don't understand gold. They think it's a joke or they think it's maybe a commodity trade or a momentum trade. They don't understand that it really is a money par excellence. So now we've learned that money was born in roughly 630 BC when it became fungible. It was free markets and sound money that led to Athens' great prosperity. But debasement of their money for deficit spending on war and public works played a large role in their demise. Over the past 140 years, we've debased our own currencies to the point where two generations of scholars don't even understand gold. We learned about Gresham's Law and that bad money drives out good. In recent history, there has been a new monetary system roughly every 40 years. And we've learned that we are in the sixth stage of the seven stages of empire. So that's it for this episode. Join us next time when we learn more about the chaotic state of the U.S. dollar standard and how it's going to affect you no matter where you live on the planet. I'm in Singapore and I'm about to go on stage in just a few minutes. I have not given a presentation for over a year now. I was in a little fender bender a while back and so I took a little bit of time off. There's this sense of urgency now. The global dollar standard was put in place by a series of accidental events that were very fortunate for the United States because it gave us an advantage over the rest of the world. But our politicians over the past decade or so have abused this privilege as though it was their birthright. And now the rest of the world are turning their backs on the U.S. dollar standard. This is going to cause a financial calamity the likes of which we've never seen before and it's going to be devastating for most people. I don't want this to happen, but the damage has already been done. So I'm going around trying to alert people and show them how they can protect themselves and turn this into a great opportunity for themselves. So there's always one result from what we are doing right now, expanding the currency supplies all over the planet. There's one result and that is higher gold and silver prices. I love America, at least the America that the Founding Fathers created, and I'm hoping that people get interested in this so that they'll see that what made America great is the answer to our problems, to get back to free markets, free people, and sound money. Our own history proves that this is the road to maximum prosperity. I was born in Salem, Oregon in 1956, and we moved to California when I was four years old in 1960. But <clears throat> when I went to school, uh, it was obvious after uh, just the uh, fourth grade that there was something different with me. And by fifth grade, I was in remedial classes, and it turned out that I was dyslexic, and teachers were not taught to recognize that back then. I was always falling behind everyone else. Uh, when I would get a teacher that would 
uh, lecture instead of making us read out of books, I would just absolutely excel. I suddenly went from the dumbest kid in class to the smartest kid in all of the periods of that class. But uh, the result was that, um, you know, after a while I was in every single remedial class and I just couldn't take it. Uh, and in 10th grade I dropped out, middle of 10th grade, and I've never been back to school. I often say that in every crisis there's an opportunity. And in this case, uh, it, the handicap of dyslexia has also been a blessing. Because I couldn't learn out of books and I couldn't take notes, I just had to remember everything. And I have the ability to, uh, my brain's wired a little bit differently. I have the ability to uh, look at a chart uh, today and I know how it relates to a chart that I saw 10 years ago. But it was back in about the year 2000 when Steve Jobs of Apple introduced OS X, the world of books opened up to me, built right into the operating system, was a text-to-speech program. Now I could just have an assistant slice and scan my books and turn them into text and email me, and then all I have to do is highlight the text, press a button, and the computer reads to me. People are turning to assets that will keep their value if prices rise. So much money has been pumped into the system that people are worried about inflation down the road, said Bruno S. Fry, professor of economics at the University of Zurich. So dyslexia is no longer a problem. But what it's also done for me is I have the ability to explain complex things to people in a simple manner for some reason. And so I sort of made it my mission uh, to try and wake up the middle class, to let them know how the monetary system works, to let them know that there is a major economic calamity coming sometime down the road and it's most likely within this decade that we're in right now. The US dollar is about 60 percent of the value of all the currency on the planet and more than half of the dollars reside outside the United States. The reason they uh, every country has U.S. dollars is, first of all, that's what central banks use as a reserve currency. Second of all, oil is priced in dollars. So, this is the world, and what, we, what you see here is that these are the countries that are avoiding the U.S. dollar in trade. They're doing bilateral agreements where they'll either hold each other's currency and settle that way, or they're establishing, like right now, they're talking about a BRICS bank, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa having a bank that will do settlements between the countries directly without using the U.S. dollar. These countries, they tried to avoid using the U.S. dollar like Iran tried and we banned them from using SWIFT. How many here have made wire transfers before? So do you know what a SWIFT number is? It's, it's a code that you plug in and this SWIFT system is what transfers those dollars uh, from uh, one person's account to another person's account. Well, Iran decided that they were going to sell oil only in euros. Uh, they got banned from SWIFT. But there's countries right now coming up with a replacement for SWIFT. And it doesn't use the dollar, it's the Sucre system. And Iraq started selling oil for euros. Uh, in Libya, they were talking about creating the gold dinar and, and selling oil for gold. So those are the countries that are trying to use something other than the dollar. Then we've got gold competing with currency. And there's a lot of talk around here about the gold dinar. And there's people that are actually using gold in some of the countries over here. And then in Utah, Utah has recognized gold and silver as money again. It's legal tender currency in the state of Utah in the United States. And then you've got physical gold accumulation. I'll show you later that China is accumulating an immense amount of gold, but all the countries with an up arrow, that's gold accumulation. Then we have gold repatriation. Germany has been asking for their gold back and they're getting it. Uh, Venezuela has repatriated their gold from the Bank of England. And then, if we put this on a timeline, here's the nails in the coffin for the dollar standard, and you will see that there's not a lot of time left. This is my evidence that I think is proof that the death of the dollar is coming, and it's coming shortly. Nixon ended Bretton Woods, and we went on the dollar standard. 
Then the first nail in the coffin is Iraq sells oil in euros. The crisis of 2008, and we added 1.25 trillion to our base money in the United States. As we add to the base currency, people get worried about inflation. They start rushing toward gold and silver. Iran ends oil sales in dollars, and they're taking commodities in trade for oil. They're taking uh, in Turkey. They take the local currency and then buy gold in Turkey and export the gold to Iran. So they're basically selling oil for gold. They do the same thing with India. QE2, quantitative easing, that's uh, more currency printing in the United States. Libya, China and Russia bypassed the dollar. They did a bilateral trade agreement where they uh, hold each other's currency and they do direct debt settlement without having to wire transfer U.S. dollars. Chinese president just recently said that the uh, dollar as the world's reserve currency is a product of the past. Utah recognized silver and gold as money. China and Iran bypassed the U.S. dollar with a bilateral trade agreement. Venezuela repatriates its gold. China and Japan trade directly. India and Japan bypass the U.S. dollar. Russia and Iran trade directly. Iran sells India oil for rupees and commodities. China and Brazil trade directly. Swiss citizens demand gold repatriation. African countries ban the dollar. In Zambia, you can go to jail if you use U.S. dollars. Uh, quantitative easing number three. They have announced at the Federal Reserve that they're going to be, they're starting with $40 billion of currency that they're creating each month and now it jumps to $85 billion. That's more than $1 trillion a year. And remember, it took 200 years to go from no dollars to $825 billion, and now they're going to create a trillion every year. Iran trading energy for gold. Singapore removes tax on money. Germany repatriates 150 tons of gold from the New York Fed. The citizens of Netherlands demand gold repatriation. Ecuador repatriates part of its gold reserves. Austrian citizens demanding gold repatriation. China acknowledges fundamental market shortage of gold. And now the Fed is increasing the rate of printing. I said from 40 to 85 billion every month, just over a trillion per year. So those are the nails in the coffin for the dollar standard. And if you noticed, they're all speeding up and they're all happening right now. You don't have a whole lot of time. And if you wait too long, then the opportunity is gone. It's going to fail. Why is the dollar sacrosanct? Why is it not going to happen to the US dollar? What will? But people think, oh no, it's high technology. We have computers now or the internet. And these are ridiculous arguments. The truth is all fiat currencies have failed and there's no reason why this one won't. What worries me again so much is that it's a global situation. And so it's going to cause problems on a global basis. And it's a trust breaking down. And you've already seen the trust breaking down, as I said earlier, because you're seeing different countries exchange directly with each other's currency, circumventing the dollar. You're seeing that in oil. You're going to see it more and more. And people are just going to opt out of the dollar. And you'll probably get to a point before the whole thing collapses entirely where the dollar is more or less used internally in the United States and externally is not used as much because there'll be a lot of uh, agreements made between nation states outside of the United States that will want to use each other's currency and not the dollar. This isn't going to be pretty when it happens. I am not an end-of-worlder or a doomsday guy. All you can do is play the hand that you are dealt. If we go to a new monetary system, and I think it's absolutely inevitable, uh, there's just too much energy built up in, in this one that has to release. It has to come crashing down somehow. Uh, when that happens, there's an enormous wealth transfer uh, for people that are on one side of the bet or another. And people don't realize that whether they, are, they think they are making a bet or not, they are making the bet. Uh, they are involved. This wealth transfer affects everybody whether you want to participate or not. If you're holding paper assets uh, and uh, paper currencies, you have bet one direction. If you're holding gold and, and physical assets, you've bet the opposite direction. So these are changes in Chinese holdings. They are accumulating gold. They are getting rid of US Treasury bonds. 
this is gold held in China. The green line is the cumulative gold that's on this side, this scale. So it's gone from about 700 tons to almost 6,000 tons just since the year 2000. So this is their central bank holdings. This is their mine, mine supply. But this is, and my researcher put all of this data together. You're the first people to see this. This is the amount of uh, gold flowing through the Hong Kong exchange that goes into China. And the past couple of years here, they have ramped up their buying. They know that the dollar standard is coming to an end. And they are protecting themselves. And you're probably going to see gold-backed renminbi someday, the yuan. So <clears throat> this is an interesting chart. Uh, change in global influence. So this is the correlation to this basket of currencies. This basket of currencies, if you add them all up, they're trading up or they're trading down. And this was pre-crisis, so it's before 2008. So this is from the International Monetary Fund. It's their data. So from 2005 to 2008, this is the correlation of, you know, if that basket of currencies was trading up, the dollar was probably doing about the same thing as what it's saying. The Chinese renminbi, a little less so. And then, this is today. The U.S. dollar is done for. I don't think there's any question we're heading for a new monetary system. The question is what will it consist of? You know, the four choices are sort of a, res a world of multiple reserve currencies. And Barry Eichengreen of uh, Berkeley is the leading proponent of this, or leading uh, a scholar on this topic. The problem with that, and where I disagree with Eichengreen, is there's no anchor in that system. We did have multiple reserve currencies before in the 1920s. He's right about that. And it was sterling and the dollar, but they were both anchored to gold. And in the post uh, Bretton Woods world, since 1944, it's been one reserve currency, which is the anchor, and it was anchored to gold until 1971. Since then, the dollar has been detached from gold, but all the other currencies are still linked to the dollar. So at the end of the day, we've had an anchor of some kind. We've never had a world of multiple reserve currencies with no anchor. I'm not sure that's that stable. The SDR is the second choice. The SDR is a basket currency sponsored by the IMF. Uh, at least for the time being, it's also printed money. The, the IMF literally prints the SDRs and ships them out to the members. And their reserves go up, exactly the way the Fed creates money and, and bank reserves go up. Uh, but it's not backed by anything. Third choice is gold, some variation on the gold standard. Uh, and the fourth choice is uh, what I call chaos, which is that nobody does anything. There's a lot of wishful thinking. There's a lot of denial. There's a lot of delay. And we get to the point where people just totally lose faith in paper currencies go to hard assets and we have a sequential collapse of paper currencies around the world at which point governments will have to react with emergency measures and that could include coercion, confiscation, um, you know, various sorts of freezes on paper assets. There could be a lot of things in that scenario so uh, to me it's multiple reserve currencies, SDRs, gold or chaos. Um, I favor gold but I fear that we may get chaos. I've talked about every 30 to 40 years the world has a new monetary system. And the thing is that over the years, governments and, these central, and the banks have basically screwed us more and more and more. Uh, and these new currency systems are always created by the same idiots that created the last one that fell apart. It's the big banks, it's the central banks, and it's governments that are creating these new systems each time. And each time, the system they come up with is a system that cheats the population more and enriches the government and the banks more. It's a system that transfers wealth uh, at greater and greater speeds. You know, this one is going to fall apart just like all of the others. Uh, there's a difference this time, though. There's the Internet. People are connected all over the world. Information is spreading, and people are getting educated. So I'm hoping that we go back to gold. Not a gold standard. Gold standards suck. <laughs> I did a video on that. With a gold standard, uh, there's supposed to be a certain amount of gold in the vaults for each unit of currency. In other words, it's a one-to-one -one ratio is the way that it started. And then they print more receipts than gold that exists. So if we have gold standards, we're going to get scammed again.
If we used gold and silver, if the public gets educated enough before all of this happens, if we went back to gold and silver, then governments can't scam us. It limits uh, their ability to transfer wealth from the population to the government and to the banks. A lot of people say that you can't use gold and silver today because they're too heavy and bulky, and it's completely wrong. You could put gold and silver in a vault, and you could make payments to somebody by transferring ownership of nanograms, grams, or ounces of gold and silver from one person's account to another by means of a check, a credit card, or even your cell phone. If we go back to a gold-backed currency, gold-backed U.S. dollar, at that point, I think the minimum scam <laughs> that the U.S. could get away with, which means the minimum number of dollars in existence that they could make convertible into gold, would be the dollars that are held in foreign central banks. That would be similar to the Bretton Woods system that we had from 1944 to 71. Well, I did some analysis on this when I was writing the book back in 2005, and back then it required $20,000 an ounce gold for the Treasury to have enough gold to cover those dollars, or the New York Fed, actually. And if they were going to back all of the dollars, you're talking gold measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per ounce. There just isn't that much gold, and there's a whole lot of currency. We keep on printing it every minute of every day. This is gold and how it accounts for a currency supply. This is our base money in the United States, which was gold back here from 1900 until the Federal Reserve. The amount of currency in circulation in gold were the same. And then we established the Federal Reserve and, and we inflated for World War I, and we had more currency in circulation than we had gold to back it. There were some bank runs in the 30s, then Roosevelt unpegged the dollar from gold, and gold's value rose from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, and when it did, the value of the gold held at the U.S. Treasury rose to meet the value of all the currency that was printed in the meantime. Here's the same chart again, but now I'm taking it out to 1971, and what you see is these gold inflows during World War I, during World War II, it's another 117% uh, gold increase. This is what made the United States a superpower. It's all financial. It isn't our war machine necessarily. It's, it's all the gold inflows that we got because everybody else was at war and we were isolated from it. And they had to pay us for all their consumer goods and so on. And then we jumped into the war and we inflated. And then in about 1959, countries started figuring out that we didn't have all the gold. You know, we were printing more dollars than gold that we had to back it. And under the Bretton Woods system, they could go to the New York Fed and turn in their dollars for gold at $35 per ounce. Only foreign central banks. Individuals couldn't do that. Uh, so gold started flowing out, and the U.S. lost 50% of its gold from 59 to 71. And in the meantime, we kept on printing currency. If this had continued until it got down to zero, if there was one more dollar out there that laid claim to gold, that came in and said, we want our gold for a currency, and there was no gold to back it up, the entire world monetary system would have come crashing down. So Nixon had to take us off of the Bretton Woods system, the last vestiges of the gold standard in August 15th of 71. So here's the same chart again. Uh, there's the first chart and the second chart to 71, and now I'm taking it out to 85, and I'm adding a second line here. How many, how many people would agree that credit cards are replacing cash in circulation? Yeah? Credit cards, you use your credit card more and more every year, right? You use cash less and less. Well, this is outstanding credit card balances. It's called Re revolving credit outstanding is the name of the chart that you get from the Federal Reserve. When you charge something on a credit card, you create currency. Uh, the bank didn't actually loan you anything. They invented numbers. And then they have the gall to charge you interest if you don't pay those numbers back on time. <laughs> but uh, so the thing is that the merchant that you're paying, the restaurant or the grocery store, that merchant's checking account 
can't tell the difference between the credit dollars that you created or the cash dollars that you pay them. So to that merchant's checking account, it all looks the same. And those dollars that you created stay in circulation until somebody saves them up and pays down credit card debt. So unpaid credit card balances I include as part of the cash in circulation. And in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard and gold became a freely traded separate commodity slash money. And it did an accounting of the currency supply. There was quite a while here where we could have gone back on the gold standard. The value of the gold at the treasury exceeded all the dollars printed from George Washington to Jimmy Carter. And for a week or so, a couple of weeks, it uh, exceeded out base money plus outstanding revolving credit. So here's the same chart again. That was to 1985, and now I'm going to take it out to today. And so there's that 1980 peak where it shot past base money and base money plus outstanding revolving credit. And then we get to the crisis of 08. And uh, Ben Bernanke, oh, by the way, instead of billions, we're now measuring in trillions. So we started in millions, and then it went to billions, and now it's trillions. So we did the bailouts and all the quantitative easings, and that's what the currency supply looks like today. And then they announced quantitative easing three which is that $85 billion a month that they're creating, and they think they're going to have to do it until about 2015. So here's the projection for gold covering the currency supply today would be $13,400 per ounce gold for history to repeat and for gold to do the same thing that it did in 1934 and in 1980. And believe me, it shocked people in, 19, in the 1970s. When gold was $35 an ounce and Nixon took us off the Bretton Woods system, all the economists were predicting that gold was going to go down because now there was going to be no more monetary demand for it. Anybody that said gold was going to go to 100 bucks was considered an absolute lunatic, and it went to 850 It rose 24 times its price. Well, when I wrote my book, we were right here with base money. So base money plus outstanding rolling credit. It took about $6,000 an ounce for history to repeat. Today it takes 13400 And if you include the same overshoot, remember in 1980 it didn't just cover base money, but it shot past it. $24,000 an ounce gold is what it would require to meet that. Except we've, the Fed has announced that they're going to keep on printing currency until there's lower unemployment and the economy gets back on track. And they think till 2015. So the projected price, according to the Fed and history repeating, if, that was to, if, if the Fed does this and then history repeats and gold, the, the public gets afraid of what the Federal Reserve is doing and they rush toward gold and silver to protect their purchasing power, gold would have to rise from there to way up here, and that is $26,000 per ounce gold to cover. If it does the same overshoot, we're talking about $47,000 an ounce gold. Now, I don't even like to measure gold in dollars. If you measure it in a price, price doesn't mean anything. It's the value. How much can you buy with the proceeds? If we have deflation and some of this currency evaporates, because it's all just numbers that they type into a computer these days, if we have deflation, maybe gold peaks at $3,000 an ounce and the currency supply collapses to way down here somewhere. Uh, and the Dow is at 1,500. That means gold will still be double the Dow. You're still going to get 14 times more paper assets one day than you can buy today with them. And it's probably only a couple of years left that this is going to take, as you saw by how the nails in the coffin of the dollar standard, how they're speeding up. Uh, if we have big inflation and the Dow goes to uh, 30,000, maybe gold will be 60,000 an ounce. And if we have hyperinflation, the Dow would be uh, uh, 30 trillion and gold would be 60 trillion. It doesn't matter. In any case, gold would buy you 14 times more paper assets than it does today. So <clears throat> these are the global assets. Here's the, the bond market. Here's the stock market. This is the value of real estate on the planet. And uh, these are bank deposits, and there's gold. Now, 
That little slice of the pie is going to get a lot bigger in just the next few years, and it's not going to do it by a whole bunch more gold just appearing. It's going to do it by the price of other assets going down, or at least their value going down, and the value of gold going up. So the price of gold will change. That piece of the pie is going to grow. It was a lot bigger back in 1980 when gold was at $850. It's going to get a lot bigger today again, but today, as you've seen, it requires far, far higher prices. So, the death of the dollar standard. Does, how many people here believe that I'm sort of predicting what's going on in the future here? You can see that there's a new world monetary system coming. It happens every 30 to 40 years, except this time, instead of a baby step off of gold, we've got to go from nothing back to something. It's going to be a worldwide convulsion, the scale of which has never been seen before. At the end of the day, the fundamental, fundamental driver of gold, it's not so much that gold's in a bull market, it's more the dollar's in a bear market. And people say, well, how high can gold go? And my answer is, well, how low can the dollar go? The answer is the dollar can go to zero. If you divide any number by zero, the answer is infinity. So gold can go to infinity if the dollar goes to zero. Now, in the real world, something else will happen. It's not that gold becomes worth infinite number of dollars. It's more the case that the dollar just falls off the stage. The dollar gets the hook, so to speak. And you, you, you'll count gold in dollars to 5,000 to 10,000 at some point, but there'll come a time when you won't count gold in dollars anymore because dollars won't count. People won't want dollars. There is so much opportunity in crisis, it is absolutely extraordinary. That's just not me saying that, that's just history. You read any amount of history, and I don't mean last week, I mean real history. You know, in times of crisis, it's when huge fortunes were made. In times of crisis, it's when human beings create and develop newest technologies and new science and new medicines. In times of crisis, there's so much opportunity, as long as you can remain calm, get educated, uh, be resourceful. The challenge for most people is that in crisis, they go into crisis mode which means they go into scarcity, they go into lack, they go into blame, and none of those emotions are resourceful for helping you solve whatever challenge is in front of you. I believe that this is probably the greatest opportunity of anyone's lifetime. There has never been a situation where all the, everything came together just like this. This is the first time in history where all the world's currencies are just fiat currencies backed by nothing. And if what, happen, what I think is going to happen, happens, this is the greatest wealth transfer in history. It's the greatest opportunity, and it'll never happen in our lifetimes again. So now we've learned the following hidden secrets of money. There is a global loss of confidence in the US dollar that is accelerating rapidly. The change to a new monetary system is inevitable and will most likely be chaotic. Gold standards do not work over long periods of time, but gold itself does. The public contributes to the massive amounts of currency creation by using credit cards and signing loans. Gold has already accounted for the expansion of US dollars twice in the last century and may likely do so again. So that's it for this episode. I thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. I know I threw around a bunch of astronomical prices for gold someday in the future, but it isn't the price measured in dollars, it's how much is its value, what is it worth, how much stuff can it purchase. The price measured in dollars, or any currency for that matter, is just a bunch of numbers and it really doesn't mean anything. There are numbers that are created by the world's central banks, by the commercial bank system, and we're forced to transact in these currencies. But in our next episode, we're going to clear away the smoke screen of national currencies and show you how the world monetary system really works and how all national currencies have to continue losing value. It is not possible for them to maintain purchasing power over any reasonable period of time. As for the golden nails in the dollar's coffin, it's only been a short while since we filmed the presentation in Singapore and already there are more of them. You are about to learn one of the biggest secrets in the history of the world. It's a secret that has huge effects for everyone who lives on this planet. Most people can feel deep down that something isn't quite right with the world economy. 
but few know what it is. Gone are the days where a family can survive on just one paycheck. Every day it seems things are more and more out of control, yet only one in a million understand why. You are about to discover the system that is ultimately responsible for most of the inequality in our world today. The powers that be do not want you to know about this, as this system is what has kept them at the top of the financial food chain for the last 100 years. Learning this will change your life because it will change the choices that you make. If enough people learn it, it will change the world because it will change the system. For this is the biggest hidden secret of money. Never in human history have so many been plundered by so few. And it's all accomplished through this, the biggest scam in the history of mankind. They say that money doesn't grow on trees, but the truth is that the modern banking system creates currency far faster than trees can grow. Most people don't have a clue how currency is created. Economists and bankers make it sound so complex that people think they can't understand it. But I'm going to strip our monetary system down to its essence so that you can see the scam behind the curtain and just how it affects you. Every modern society creates currency in pretty much the same way. But since the U.S. dollar is the majority of the world's currency, I'm going to use the United States as our example. It all starts when some politician says, vote for me and I'll make sure the government provides you more free stuff than my opponent will. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to provide that supposedly free stuff, the politicians vote for the country to spend more than its income. This is called deficit spending. To pay for that deficit spending, the Treasury borrows currency by issuing a bond. So what's a bond? If you think about it, a bond is really nothing but a glorified IOU. It's a pretty piece of paper with numbers printed on it that says, loan me a trillion dollars today and I promise over a 10 year period I'm going to pay you back that trillion dollars plus interest. But what you need to understand is that treasury bonds are our national debt. These glorified IOUs are to be paid back by you and I and our descendants through future taxation. Therefore, when the government issues a bond, it steals prosperity out of the future so that it can spend it today. The Treasury then holds a bond auction, and the world's largest banks show up and compete to buy part of our national debt and make a profit on it by earning interest. You'll notice that as we move through this process, the big banks are there, taking a cut every step of the way. This isn't by chance, as you'll see shortly. Then, through a shell game called open market operations, the banks get to sell some of those bonds to the Federal Reserve at a profit. To pay for the bonds, the Federal Reserve opens up its big old checkbook and writes bad, bogus, counterfeit checks that should bounce because they're drawn on an account that always has a zero balance, there isn't one penny in there. To quote from the Boston Federal Reserve, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The Fed then hands those checks to the banks and at this point currency springs into existence. The banks then take that currency and buy more bonds at the next treasury auction. But what is a check? A check is also an IOU. When you write a check you're making a note that says here's my IOU for cash. All you have to do is go to the bank and pick it up. Now it's very very important that you understand this process because we're going to come back later and show you the devastating effect this has on you. The Treasury issues IOUs, bonds. The banks then buy those IOUs with currency. The Federal Reserve then writes IOUs, checks, and hands them to the banks in exchange for the Treasury's IOUs, the bonds. And currency is created. So what's really happening is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are just swapping IOUs using the banks as middlemen, and abracadabra, presto, currency magically springs into existence. This process repeats and repeats over and over again, enriching the banks and indebting the public by raising the national debt. The end result is that there's a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury. This process is also where all paper currency comes from. The Federal Reserve and the government mistakenly call it base money because they didn't watch episode one of this series and they don't know the difference between money and currency. But I will correctly refer to it as base currency because it is not money, 
it is currency, and as we've learned, there is a big difference. Money has to be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. We learned in episode one that earlier in our history, our paper currency was just a claim check. It was a representation for real money of intrinsic value, the gold and silver that was held on deposit at the treasury. You could walk into any bank and slap your currency, like say a $20 bill, on the counter and redeem it for real money, a $20 gold piece. But now, this base currency that's piling up back here is really nothing but a receipt or a claim check on an IOU, that bond. So it's really nothing but a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the newly created currency into the various branches of the government, and the politicians say, hey, thanks for that. And the government does some deficit spending on public works, social programs, and war. The government employees, contractors, and soldiers then deposit their pay in the banks. Now this may come as a shock to you, but when you deposit your currency with the bank, you're not actually depositing it into an account to be safely held in trust for you. Instead, you're actually loaning the bank your currency, and within certain legal limits, they can do with it pretty much anything they please. This includes gambling in the stock market and loaning it out, at a profit, of course. Now this is where the machine of currency creation really gets cranking, because this is where something called fractional reserve lending comes into play. Fractional reserve lending is exactly what it says. The banks are allowed to reserve only a fraction of your deposit and loan the rest out. Although reserve ratios may vary, I'm going to use a 10% reserve ratio as our example. If you deposit $100 in your account, the bank can legally take $90 of it and loan it out without telling you. The bank must hold $10 of your deposit in reserve just in case you want some of it. These reserves are called vault cash. But why does your bank account still say you have $100 if the bank has stolen $90 of it? Because the bank left IOUs it created, called bank credit, in its place. Now I know this sounds crazy, but here it is in black and white from the Fed. Commercial banks create checkbook money when they grant a loan simply by adding new deposit dollars in accounts on their books in exchange for a borrower's IOU. These are nothing but numbers that the banks type into their computers. And even though these bank credit IOU numbers are very different from base currency numbers, because they only exist in computers, they are still currency. So now there is $190 in existence. Now the reason people take out loans from the banks is to buy something. They're going to buy a house or a car or something like that. So the borrower takes the $90 that the bank loaned to him from your account and he pays the seller of the item. But then the seller deposits that currency into his account and his bank loans out 90% of that and leaves bank credit numbers in its place. So now there's $271 in existence. This process repeats and repeats until under a 10% reserve ratio, an initial deposit of just $100 can create up to $1,000 of bank credit, all backed by $100 of vault cash, just 10%. But as I said, reserve ratios vary wildly. On some deposits, it's 10%, on others, it's 3%, and on some forms of deposits, reserve requirements are zero. The result is that the expansion of the currency supply by the banks is far greater than even this example would lead you to believe. So once again, when currency is deposited in the banks, the banks get to lend it out, and then it gets redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent over and over again, creating bank credit all the way. This is where the vast majority of our currency supply comes from. In fact, 92 to 96 percent of all currency in existence is created, not by the government, but here in the banking system. Now. Massive amounts of currency spewing into society may at first sound like a fun idea. That is, until you remember one of the most important hidden secrets of money from episode one. That the prices of everyday goods and services act as a sponge on an expanding currency supply. The more currency we have, the more prices rise. This is where inflation comes from. The true definition of inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Rising prices are merely the symptom. So our entire currency supply is nothing but a couple of bucks whipped up in this hocus-pocus scam where the Treasury and the Federal Reserve swap glorified IOUs, 
and a bunch of numbers that the banks just type into their computers. That's it. That's our entire currency supply. It's nothing but a supply of numbers. Some of them printed, most of them typed, and there is nothing else. But if you thought that was crazy, get ready to enter the twilight zone of modern economics. We work for some of that currency supply. True wealth is your time, but we trade away moments of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, and year by year, for numbers that somebody printed on pieces of paper or just typed into a computer. Now those numbers represent our blood, sweat, tears, labor, ideas, and talent. We are what gives the currency its value. But here comes the really cruel joke. We work hard so that we can save some of that currency, so that we can pay the tax collector in the United States, it's known as the IRS. They then turn it over to the Treasury so that the Treasury can pay the principal plus interest on that bond that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. Now let's do a recap on this section because this is where the system begins to rob you and I on a massive scale. Much of our taxes are not used for schools, roads, and public services, but to pay interest on bonds that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. The Federal Reserve is committing fraud. But here's one of the biggest secrets of them all. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there was no need for personal income tax. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and that very same year, the Constitution was amended to allow income tax. Do you really think this was just a coincidence? Ask yourself how much income tax you've paid over your lifetime. Much of it has been silently siphoned away into the hands of those who own the system. Yes, this system has owners. Who they are is an even bigger secret that we'll get to shortly. But first, we need to understand the mumbo-jumbo of the so-called debt ceiling. It's all based on a huge paradox. There was interest due on that bond. And there was interest due on every one of those loans that the banks made. That means that there is interest due on every dollar in existence. Let me ask you something. If you borrow the very first dollar into existence, and that's the only dollar that exists on the planet, but you promise to pay it back plus another dollar's worth of interest, where do you get the second dollar to pay the interest? The answer is that you have to borrow that one into existence and promise to pay it back with interest as well. So now there are two dollars in existence, but you owe four, and so on and so on. The result is there's never enough currency to pay the debt. There is always more debt in the system than there is currency in existence to pay the debt. Therefore, the whole system is impossible. It is finite. It will come to an end one day. What would happen if the government stopped borrowing to do deficit spending? Are the payments on those treasury bonds going to stop? What would happen if the public stopped borrowing and going deeper into debt? Are your house and car payments going to stop? No. There is a payment due every month on the principal plus the interest on every dollar in existence and those payments do not stop. If we stop borrowing, then no new currency is created to replace the currency that we used to make those payments. Whether you're making a payment on a loan or paying tax to make a payment on a bond, the portion of the payment that goes to pay off the principal extinguishes that portion of the debt. But the debt also extinguishes the currency. Currency and debt are like matter and antimatter. When they meet, they annihilate each other. If we just pay off the principal only on all the loans and bonds that exist, the entire currency supply just vanishes. So if we don't go deeper into debt every year, look what happens. The whole thing goes into a deflationary collapse under the weight of those payments. Politicians and pundits alike talk about balancing the budget, paying down the debt, and living within our means. They don't understand that that is deflationary. It is impossible to do under our current monetary system without collapsing the whole economy. This is why any talk of a debt ceiling is not only ridiculous, it's delusional. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt just to continue. And that's why politicians will always kick the can down the road and raise this so-called debt ceiling over and over again until the whole system finally collapses under its own weight. 
In other words, they don't want it to collapse on their watch. The Founding Fathers of the United States knew the dangers of central banking and fought to free themselves from this very thing. The Revolutionary War started out as a tax revolt, but now we must pay tax just to have a monetary system. Having just suffered through the hyperinflation of the continental dollar, which was printed into oblivion to finance the Revolutionary War, they understood the dangers of fiat currency and debt-based monetary systems. So to protect future generations from institutional theft and out-of-control government, they wrote into the Constitution that only gold and silver can be money for the simple fact that you can't print them. Our current system is not only unconstitutional, but it robs us of the liberty and prosperity our forefathers fought and died for. We are all feeling the effects of ignoring the Constitution right now. By forcing more currency into circulation, our purchasing power is diluted. Inflation is a slow and insidious stealth tax that is simply the result of this debt-based monetary system. This system empowers and benefits those who create the currency and receive it first, as they get to spend it into circulation before it has an effect on the economy. They're stealing purchasing power from you and transferring it to the banks and the government every hour of every day because of this false monetary system. And it's not like the people at the top don't know this. To quote the Federal Reserve, the decrease in purchasing power incurred by the holders of money due to inflation imparts gains to the issuers of money. This is a fraud. It is a pyramid scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam and it's a lie. Our entire monetary system is nothing but a form of legalized theft. But here's the biggest con job of them all. The Federal Reserve is not federal. It has stockholders. There is no federal agency that has stockholders. What's a stockholder? A share of stock represents a percentage of ownership in a corporation. So the stockholders are the owners of that corporation. Therefore, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation with owners. And you can see it for yourself if you go to the Federal Reserve's website, and it will say, the stockholders receive an annual dividend of 6%. Now we know that the stock in the Federal Reserve was originally issued to the largest banks in the United States. But because of mergers and acquisitions through the years, you can't actually trace who owns the stock in the Federal Reserve. That's a very closely guarded secret. My guess would be that the owners are those primary dealers, the banks that get to make a profit by selling part of our national debt, those bonds, to the Federal Reserve who buys them with a check from nothing. Then we pay tax to pay the principal and the interest on those bonds so that the Federal Reserve can pay the banks a 6% dividend. Don't be alarmed if you don't quite comprehend the deception of this system at first glance. Very few people do. It is purposely complex. The economist John Maynard Keynes once wrote, by this means government may secretly and unobserved confiscate the wealth of the people and not one man in a million will detect the theft. I believe that presented correctly, anyone can understand this system, regardless of how complex it is. So let's do a recap and break it down even more. The way the system works is that, step one, the government creates glorified IOUs. These bonds increase our national debt and put the public on the hook to pay it back. Step two, IOUs are swapped to create currency. The Treasury sells the bonds to the banks. The banks then turn around and sell our national debt at a profit to the Federal Reserve, which they probably own. The Federal Reserve then opens its checkbook that doesn't have a penny in it and buys those IOUs with IOUs that it writes, checks, on a checking account that has a zero balance. Then they give those checks to the banks and currency just springs into existence. And then the whole process repeats. This results in a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury, which is really just a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the numbers in the various branches of the government, and we get to step three. The government spends the numbers on promises, public works, social programs, and war. Then the government employees, contractors, and soldiers deposit their pay into the banks, and we get to step four where the banks multiply the numbers by magically inventing more IOUs through fractional reserve lending, where they steal a portion of everyone's deposit and lend it out. 
that currency gets redeposited and then a portion is stolen again and the process repeats over and over magnifying the currency supply exponentially. Then we work for some of those numbers. Which brings us to step five, where our numbers are taxed. We pay tax to the IRS, who then turns our numbers over to the Treasury, so the Treasury can pay the principal plus the interest on bonds that were purchased by the Federal Reserve with a check from nothing. Then we get to step six, the debt ceiling delusion. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt and will eventually collapse under its own weight because politicians always kick the can down the road. They don't want it to collapse on their watch. And finally, step seven, the secret owners take their cut. The world's largest banks own the Federal Reserve. Those banks make a profit selling our national debt to the Fed. They make a profit when the Fed pays them interest on the reserves held at the Fed and the Fed pays them a 6% dividend on their ownership of the Fed. This system is fundamentally evil. It funnels wealth from the working population to the government and the banking sector. It is the cause of the artificial booms and busts of modern economies, and it causes great disparity of wealth between the rich and the working class. And it is only possible because we no longer use real money, we use currency. But worst of all, it is a form of enslavement. Bond is the root word of bondage. Whenever a government issues a bond, it is a promise to make us pay tax in the future. Nobody asked you if you wanted to pay tax today for the prosperity we all enjoyed in the last century. Nobody is asking our children if they want to work hard in the future to pay for the prosperity we're enjoying now. George Washington once wrote to James Madison, no generation has the right to contract debts greater than can be paid off during the course of its own existence. By stealing prosperity from tomorrow so we can spend it today, we enslave ourselves and future generations. Now this all sounds pretty bad, but there is great hope, for you are the greatest threat to this false monetary system. This system relies on the public being ignorant of its workings. Please share this knowledge with everyone you know, because an informed public that fully understands the system can build a better future for generations to come. And now I leave you with this quote, widely attributed to a former director of the Bank of England. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in inequity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money and control credit, and with the flick of a pen, they will create enough money to buy it back again. But if you want to continue as the slaves of bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, let them continue to create money and to control credit. This is the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. It's located on Constitution Street, and that is just as much of a joke as the New York Fed being located on Liberty Street. Both of them are unconstitutional, both of them limit our liberty, and they transfer wealth away from us every second of every day to the Federal Reserve, to the government, and to the banking sector. You are now among the one in a million who can detect the theft of your prosperity. So the big question is, what can you do about it? One, watch this video until you can describe and teach it to others. Those who understand this system can make preparations for its unavoidable collapse and protect themselves. History shows that those who don't will probably be wiped out. I think uh, your episode four is very beneficial, very helpful. It's going to introduce these ideas uh, to a lot of people. And like I've just been talking about, we have to change people's mind. And the more they understand it, the better. 
And I think we're at this point now where more people in the last several years, four or five years, have thought about the Fed than they ever have in the, last, in the previous 95 years. So I think uh, an explanation and diagrams to show it is very helpful because, quite frankly, they're not going to get it in their grade school. They're not going to get it in their high schools. They're not going to get it in college unless they're in a very rare circumstance to understand how, uh, how this works. You know, for years before I got involved in um, really studying gold and some of the things I write and talk about today, I was a monetary economist for decades. You know, in your uh, mm -hmm. video, you talk about the primary dealers. I was uh, chief counsel and chief credit officer, one of the largest primary dealers for 10 years. So I had an inside seat on the Treasury market and have the privilege of working with several uh, former vice chairman of the Board of Governors, uh, Manley Johnson. and. Uh, David Mullins going back to the 80s and 90s. So I'm very immersed in what you were talking about. I thought it was ex extremely accurate, extremely clear. I didn't think you were stretching on any points. It was it was really like something out of a PhD course, except that it was very easy to understand. I think it's accessible. I think I think we're seeing a little bit of a revolution in communications in the following sense. You know, as you point out, the Fed was created in 1913. Well, in 1913. There was no web, there was no YouTube, no Twitter. Uh, there was really no one to kind of stand up and uh, uh, oppose the Fed or call them out, if you will, or really get into a discussion that everyday Americans could follow. That's not true now with, uh, with social media and, and everything else. Uh, you can reach out to millions and tens of millions of people and tell them what's going on. I think you've done that. You've done it successfully. I, I applaud it. I think this is a great video. I look forward to seeing it again. I know millions of people will enjoy it. Well, as we know, the Federal Reserve believes it can uh, create money out of thin air, not realize money is supposed to represent real products and services. And uh, what uh, people don't realize is when the Fed does that, in effect, as Keynes pointed out, it's a form of taxation. It's a form of confiscation. And uh, because people don't see it, uh, the, the politicos get away with it, but it also undermines uh, social trust. It uh, just is uh, corrosive throughout society. We're going to have a lot of turmoil in the coming years, but it's going to be the kind of turmoil that leads to positive things. So uh, don't despair. Uh, get out there and fight because uh, the tide is going to turn. This is going to be the status last stand. Thank you. <laughs>The entire world is facing a debt-driven disaster the scale of which has never been seen before in human history. The situation is now so severe that we're left with only two options, default on our debt or inflate it away. You can already hear people blaming the free markets and even money itself for our problems and to me this is just tragic because we don't have free markets anymore and we certainly don't use real money. This is the real reason for our problems. Our money itself has been corrupted. It's not just an issue of economics. This affects your freedom. When this crisis hits, people will be screaming for the government to do something when it was the government that caused the problems in the first place. Many societies have faced this dilemma in the past and we can learn what the outcomes might be simply by studying what they did and comparing it to what we're doing today. So while I was in Germany, I decided to stop by one of my favorite museums and take you on a kind of crash course of the history of real money, how it evolved, and the twin dangers that arise when money is corrupted. I'm here at the Bundesbank Money Museum in Germany, and this is one of the best museums I have ever seen. Uh, right at the very beginning of the museum, you walk in and it starts with barter. You know, originally, the first form of currency was livestock. The problem with livestock, though, like for instance this cow, if I traded this cow to you for something, and somebody else wants to trade you something else that's of much lower value, you can't make change. <laughs> a system that relies on barter is very inefficient because you not only suffer from the problems of divisibility, you also rely on the hope that you will find someone who has a good or service that you need, who wants something that you have at the same place and at the same time. In economics, this is called the coincidence of wants. Now add the fact that most goods have a shelf life before they perish and you can see why barter systems held mankind back for so long. So what was it that solved the coincidence of wants and propelled us out of the Stone Age and into space? It was the invention of money. Money is not evil. 
It is a magnificent tool that allows us to trade our specialized skills and to store our economic energy. Without it, we'd be struggling to feed ourselves each day and our average lifespan would still be 30. In episode one, we learned that real money has to fulfill certain properties in order to function. But 2,600 years after its emergence, people still confuse money with currency, even the so-called experts. So they've got here uh, some of the things about what money is. The first example here is money is whatever goes. So in earlier cultures, commodities such as cattle, stones, or metals were used as money. Buyers took the value of the goods on trust when making their purchase. Today, too, money is a question of confidence. So uh, the currency, today isn't money, today we're using currency, but the only reason it has any purchasing power whatsoever is because yesterday your experience was that it, it purchased something. So you have faith that it's going to purchase something tomorrow. Otherwise, it has no value. Whatever form it takes, reliable money has two characteristics. It is genuine and it is stable. People can rely on its value. Well, you know, what fiat currency around the planet has maintained its value? They all fall in value. So right away, you can see the difference. They're, they're talking about currency here. And when they say it's genuine, I mean, what is genuine? A counterfeiter, somebody that's running their own printing press in their basement, is making genuine notes as far as he's concerned. I mean, they're, they're genuine counterfeits. <laughs> These things that just come off of a printing press, well, yeah, it's a genuine lie from a central bank or a government that you've got something that's going to store value for you because it doesn't over long periods of time. It loses value. Gold, banknotes, and electronic money, meaning electronic currency, may be stored, divided up, or transported. As its material value has declined over time, its genuineness has had to be beyond question. Well, this one says that it's got to maintain its value, and right here they're contradicting uh, the, the next one. The one thing here, gold, is the only thing that they're talking about that has not lost its value. In the past, rare goods were used as money. Today, central banks must ensure that the supply of money is restricted. Well, what are they doing all over the planet today? They're lifting all the restrictions on how much currency they're creating. They're flooding the planet with currency. The next display shows the usual museum pieces that are described as commodity money. Cowrie shells, representative axes, coca beans, and the like. While these work better than barter, none of them were actually money because they all had a weakness. One or more properties of money that they couldn't fulfill. Therefore, they are commodity currencies, not money. Some of these were widely used right up until the beginning of the 20th century, and there's some stuff here that I haven't seen before. Here's something very interesting. This brick of tea, its value is in the intrinsic. It's in the commodity that you're using. It's, it's the tea. But this one has a certain fungibility to it. Each unit would have the same value, and you can make change. You can snap these things apart into units of six. It's portable. It's not that heavy. This fulfills quite a few of the functions of money. I would not imagine that it's that durable. It probably doesn't wear that well. And now we come to the emergence of real money. Here we have little pieces of metal, just little pieces that have been broken off of bars or something that was cast, uh, other little blobs of metal that were traded as a currency. You know, they had purchasing power, they had an intrinsic value, but they still weren't fungible, which means interchangeable. Every one of them had a, a different value. You can see that some of them have a higher silver content, some of them have a higher gold content. These are called electrum. It's a mixture of gold and silver, naturally occurring. What you notice is that this is from the 7th century BC, and then between the 7th and the 6th century, we're talking about somewhere between 680 and 630 BC, the emergence of true money. Here we've got four coins. The large one is a one-third stater coin, and the other three are one-sixth stater coins. Each unit is interchangeable. You can, it's now a unit of account. 
You can take so many of these in trade for so many of loaves of bread and you don't have to get, break out your little scale and weigh them any longer. With the little chunks of metal, you had to weigh every transaction that was going on. You had to weigh whatever your payment was and then take a guess as to what the purity was. Here you have some standards that were set by mints and guaranteed by those mints. These are a unit of account. They're fungible. Every one of them is interchangeable. They're portable, they're durable uh, in your pocket over long periods of time. Uh, they're divisible, you can make change. You can see there's a one-third stater and one-sixth staters. Uh, and they're a store of value over long periods of time. These still have purchasing power today, uh, 2,600 years after they were made. Another thing that I find really interesting is between maybe 680 BC and, and 300 BC, cultures all around the world, they all gravitated toward gold and silver coinage as money. The entire world sort of decided all together that gold and silver were money. Why? Because the free markets keep on selecting gold and silver as money because of the properties that it has. So, now we get to the room of real money. This is a vault door, and this is where they've got all the great examples of the real gold and silver coins. So come on in and join me. So here we get to the first, uh, this is gold and silver, what they're using to make money, and here we have some very early representations of gold and silver coins. And I love these displays. They start with coins in Lydia, so these coins go back to the very first minting of true coinage. So here we have the starting of the 6th century BC, and then it goes up to the 3rd century, and then uh, from the 5th to the 11th century, and the 13th to the 15th century, and these displays just go on and on with the history of, of real money, gold and silver. Uh, here is 17th and 18th century. Here we come to the 19th century. And now we're all the way up to the 20th century here. And here we come to our first example of government-issued fiat currency. This is uh, from China. This is from 1375. And what's interesting is I have a chart that compares the value of the paper currency in China compared to silver. And there was a hyperinflation of this currency. It wasn't backed by anything. It wasn't backed by taxes. It wasn't backed by anything in the treasury. They could just print this. And so this went into a hyperinflation because the government was just running its budget by just doing deficit spending by printing. And then I'm going to skip to some of the colonial currency. This is the United States, and each one of these currencies is printed by a different state. We've got Maryland, South Carolina, North Carolina, Connecticut, New York. This one here is particularly interesting. It's printed in the 14th year of the reign of King George III. It's dated March 25th, 1776. So this is just a few months before the Declaration of Independence. It says, uh, "'Tis death to counterfeit." But this was printed just before we started coming out with the continental dollar, which went into a hyperinflation because of pure deficit spending on the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so this is the wall where real money gets corrupted. <laughs> this is where it all turns to paper, which sometimes is backed by something, but it can be a lie. They can print more than they have of the stuff to back it. As we learned in episode two, one of the first things a country does at the outbreak of war is to suspend redemption rights so that their currency is no longer redeemable in gold. This is exactly what Germany did before World War I. After losing the war, they suffered through one of the worst hyperinflations on record when they were burdened with massive reparation payments to France and the Allies. These heavy penalties stifled the German economy and brought it to a standstill leaving the country with the same two choices all indebted nations have faced throughout history, default on their debt or inflate it away. Defaulting was not a viable option, as they were completely impoverished, weakened, and surrounded by armed forces ready to take their land. Since their currency was no longer tied to gold, it was decided to light up the printing presses and inflate their way out, 
paying the debts with new currency created out of thin air. This had drastic consequences. Check out some of this Weimar currency. The display starts with one mark that actually purchased something, but soon the notes rise to the thousands, then the millions, then the billions, and finally the trillions. It's mind-blowing. You'll notice that I'm laughing a little bit as we move through the museum, but I'm not laughing at the people. I'm laughing at the stupidity of central banks and of governments and how we never seem to learn from history. Okay, <clears throat> this is an example of, of uh, different currencies used during the hyperinflation, uh, and they call some of it inflation money and emergency money. This is interesting. They figured the way out of hyperinflation was to print more. <laughs> so in 1923, the value of money fell by 50% or more per day. So that means prices are doubling every day if it's falling by 50%. Uh, nearly everyone spent their money as quickly as possible on bread, shares, and other safe assets. Well, I don't consider shares safe assets. Actually, the stock market did not keep up with the inflation. However, this rapid circulation only served to stoke inflation even further. That's the function of velocity of money. It's just it, when velocity picks up, it's just like expanding the quantity. It's got the same effect. At the end, even 144 printing companies working for the Reichsbank could not keep up with the demand for banknotes. Emergency money issued by cities, local authorities, as well as banks and other enterprises started being circulated. So everybody was issuing currency to add to the currency that the government was printing like crazy. Although banknotes with face values of trillions of marks were issued, the vast demand for, for money, that's not correct, the vast demand for currency led to a paper shortage. Printers used anything that could be found, including wool, wood, and silk. So here's some example of wood, wool, and silk currencies over here. <laughs> So this is a great example of how even here, in a museum of what they call money, this is the Bundesbank, one of the world's great central banks, if you can call any central bank great. <laughs> they don't understand the difference between money and currency. They're calling all of this money, and it has nothing to do with money. This is just a promise. It was a promise to pay money at one point, and then it was a broken promise. People will have faith in these government-created currencies, and it allows governments to basically rob their own people. The government erased the debts of, that they had left over in, of, from World War I uh, by just hyperinflating the currency, and basically that transfers all the wealth of the middle class to the government. Uh, the government inflated away the debts, but they also inflated away the prosperity of their entire uh, population. When we were in Germany, we got a chance to shoot in front of the Bundestag, which used to be called the Reichstag. And it felt, it's very, very significant in that uh, out of monetary crisis, you very often see the political landscape change dramatically. Uh, it's the middle class of a country that defines the country with their vote. They're the largest sector of any country, about 70%. And a currency crisis like a hyperinflation wipes out and impoverishes the middle class. And they become filled with fear. And it's very easy for somebody to come in and prey on that fear. And dictators arise out of hyperinflation. And this is one of my greatest fears as far as the United States goes. I think that uh, you know, we all have to be very, very careful and very watchful for what happens in the future. A few years ago, I was interviewing Congressman Ron Paul, and he said, I think that there's going to be a financial collapse before they come around to thinking seriously about monetary policy. But the real thing we have to worry about is not the loss of our wealth. It's the rise of a dictator. It's the loss of our freedom. And what's interesting is the rise of Hitler there were two times where he played on the public sphere. He could never have come to power had there not been a hyperinflation back in 1923. Just one week before the end of that hyperinflation, that's when Hitler made his first big public appearance. Playing to the public fear, Hitler 
and his stormtroopers took over a beer hall called the Burgerbrau Keller that seats around 3,000 people. And he took the stage by gunpoint and to this literally captive audience, he gave the speech that would change the world. Because of the hyperinflation, the audience had been recently impoverished. Their wealth had been stolen by the government running the printing presses. And so they're all scared. He offers them a scapegoat and tells them he's got the way out. He became very popular after that, and the very next day, uh, the people that were listening to him followed him in an attempt to overthrow the government. He was arrested, tried, and convicted of high treason, and served time. While he was in jail, he was provided with a private secretary, Rudolf Hess, and he actually wrote about half of Mein Kampf while he was serving time. But once the economy started to recover, Hitler lost that leverage, that power. He could no longer play on the fear of the public once the economic situation had changed. By the middle of the Roaring Twenties, he had become a joke. The Nazi party had gone to less than 2% of the vote. Then along came the Great Depression, and Hitler seized this opportunity again. He was the first politician to actually campaign by aircraft, hitting multiple cities in a single day. And the Nazi party went from 2% of the vote to the second largest party in Germany. So playing on the public sphere, Hitler was able to take away the rights of Germans. He was able to, all these guaranteed rights in the Weimar Constitution, private property rights, the right to assemble, public assembly, the right to privacy uh, in the mail, uh, the telephone system. Uh, he just took away all of their rights and seized power. So these are the, some, some of the things that we have to be concerned about and be very mindful of. Economic crisis very often leads to the rise of a dictator. Yeah, the fact that this was just 70 to 80 years ago, basically there are still people alive today that experienced this, but enough of them have died off to where the warnings fall on deaf ears. Berlin is a great example of another massive danger to individual freedom that economic crisis can bring, the swing from capitalism to collectivism. After World War II, the city was basically divided in half, the West being capitalist and the East communist. Germany was reunified in 1990, but even this short period of separation showed the vastly different levels of prosperity that the two systems achieved. So this is the famous Checkpoint Charlie, and, and what's interesting is how quickly an economy can heal. Just 20 years ago, you would have seen a tremendous difference between the East and the West. You'd have one side that has tall buildings and is much more industrialized and new, and then one side that was, that's very old and gray. It was one of the best examples of what a state-run society does to an economy how the more the public relies on government, the worse the general economy gets. What happens, you know, in capitalism you have the greatest disparity uh, between the poorest and the richest individuals. And there's a backlash against that. And you see this happening happen in waves and cycles, this cycle that goes from capitalism to collectivism. Here, the example, I mean, you had this line going right through a city, and one side of the city that was very poor, and the other side prosperous by comparison. Now, when we go toward collectivism, they want to eliminate this great disparity between the poorest and the richest individuals. But what happens isn't that they raise the standard of living for the poor up here. They drag the whole economy down so that everybody ends up living down here, except for the people that are in running the government. Collectivism is a danger because we've proven time and time again that it doesn't work. The evidence is in. If you look at history, it's clear that maximum prosperity can only be achieved through individual freedom, free markets, and sound money. You'd think that we'd learn from history, but I'm going to show you a few more displays from the museum that prove conclusively we haven't. And this is where we are today. This is a sheet of 50 euro notes, and these come out of the printing press, bam, 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 just like those notes did. <laughs> and the entire world today is sort of, uh, every central bank across the planet is creating currency like crazy right now. To, I, I think we're going into a deflation, so they're trying to stave off deflation right now by printing their way out of it. So here we've got uh, some examples of the technology that governments around the world are 
putting into their counterfeit currency so that the public can't counterfeit the currency that the governments are now counterfeiting. So you've got all these holograms and watermarks and different threads and different types of paper. And then here's this big old printing plate where they pop these things out a mile a minute. And right now they are hyperinflating the base money around the world, the paper money. Uh, we're going into a deflation though of the credit money, the voodoo hocus pocus currency that the banks just type into the computer. That's starting to collapse where this stuff is expanding. So we learned in episode four that modern currency creation is a complete scam, but a whole lot of people had trouble believing that it could be true. The European Central Bank has this awesome display that shows you exactly how it's done and it's basically the same as our episode four. So here's a quick recap, thanks to the ECB. Basically, the central bank and the treasury swap IOUs. The, bank writes, the central bank writes a check and the treasury issues a treasury bond, which is an IOU, and that creates currency, and then it gets, uh, somebody is paid, it gets deposited into a bank account, and a thousand marks, they, they would hold 10%. So right here, they're already telling you that his bank account is a lie. He put, deposited a hundred, it deposited a thousand in it. They only withhold a hundred in case he wants some of that. And then they loan out 900, which then they, she buys something from this guy. He deposits the 900. They borrow 90% uh, of that and leave just 10% on deposit for him. And the result is that ex it expands every thousand, ends up creating 10,000. Or every one dollar creates ten dollars. You know, and they've got the result here. This, it's all sort of a voodoo, hocus-pocus scheme. One of the great things that I've noticed here is that throughout the museum, they keep on proving the point that uh, even though this is the Bundesbank Museum, they prove the point that fiat currencies that come off of a printing press eventually go to zero, that they're really worthless. This says the ideal goal of all monetary systems was to ensure that money is trustworthy and kept in short supply. Metal-based currencies restrict the money supply because metal deposits are naturally limited. However, during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the rapidly growing e economy needed a means of payment which could adapt flexibly to this growth. Baloney. You can have a fixed currency supply and when you have economic growth it means that the currency gains in purchasing power. In the 20th century, Uncovered currencies, meaning unbacked currencies, have been the norm. In principle, the money stock could grow unchecked. This is why central banks must ensure that the money stock is in line with economic growth. Yeah, right. So uh, here we've got my buddy Milton. Actually, Milton was sort of a semi-free market economist. He won the Nobel Prize. So he's considered the dean of the Chicago School of Monetary Thought, which are monetarists. They believe that we should have a Federal Reserve and it should expand and contract the currency supply to achieve stable prices. One of the problems with Keynesians and monetarists and so on is that they think you should expand it and contract it, but they never contract it. <laughs> they just, you know, Keynesian, you're supposed to spend when the economy is bad. The government's supposed to spend and stimulate and then withdraw currency from circulation to keep us from going into a bubble caused by the expansion of credit and the spending that they did during the bad portion of the economy. So they, they take this rubber band and they stretch it and it's supposed to come back, but they never do that. They just keep on stretching it to infinity. And here we are, uh, in, right now, where we are in the world is that that rubber band is about to snap with every currency on the planet. And so I'm instability, I'm in deflation, inflation, let me see, I'm gonna cause a hyperinflation. Oh, it just went off the inflation scale. I guess I did cause a hyperinflation, oops. <laughs> and now the whole thing is collapsing. <laughs> This game of inflation and deflation has never worked. Right now we're on the precipice of the whole system collapsing and just like the game, our monetary system will reset. This is where the twin dangers we learned about may rear their ugly heads, so it's up to all of us to learn from history. 
I mentioned earlier that it was the invention of money that allowed humans to prosper and rise out of the Stone Age. But money is only part of the equation. What use is money if you don't have freedom? So what's going to happen? Will we default or inflate our way out of the mess we're in? Since 2005, I've been stating publicly, and I also wrote in my book, that I believe we're headed toward a series of events involving a short-term deflation followed by a big inflation or hyperinflation. If you really want to learn how this inflation might affect you and your family, join me at HiddenSecretsOfMoney.com for this episode's exclusive presentation. Should I buy a half million or a million? Let me see how much... This is not going to travel well in the suitcase, but it would be good to be, have a million euros, wouldn't it? Tough decision. So, okay, I'm going to buy a quarter million euros. So uh, here's 50 euros for your quarter million. And, uh, yeah. And I get change back. This is about eight euros to buy a quarter million euros. Okay. Okay. And what's interesting is these are going to eventually be in here. <laughs> I mean, it won't be too long before these end up like this. Oh, and we get some uh, chocolate gold coins. Thank you, Shane. So that's our tour of one of the best monetary museums I've seen so far. But what amazes me is that they still just don't get it. <laughs>